Hi, welcome to the next in our series of Practical Electromagnetics for Engineers. Today we're going to be talking about plane wave interaction with matter. And if you're in my class, you can go ahead and follow along in section 7.4 of the textbook. It's going to help us a little bit, I think, to go back to our physical picture of permittivity. Remember, permittivity is the uh, macroscopic property of a material that basically says how an electric field is going to interact with matter and we remember in our picture of permittivity the electric field pushed on the electron clouds which are free to move um, but the atom core is being locked into some kind of lattice pretty much stay where they are so let's take a look at this picture and see what happens um, when we have an oscillating electric field. So as you can see over on the left hand side of the screen we have an electromagnetic wave coming in. It has a K vector going into the material. And essentially what you see is that as this electric field oscillates up and down it drives the electron clouds to oscillate with it. And one thing to notice and I've, I've really exaggerated this here um, is that the electron clouds oscillate with the spatial phase of the wave. So they're not all oscillating together. Essentially you can almost determine the wave length of the material by how those electron clouds oscillate. But in this picture, um, I really expanded things so you can see it. Obviously, electro most electromagnetic waves um, have wavelengths much, much longer than the spacing between atoms. And essentially what happens is that is that as the electromagnetic wave interacts with the material, with the atoms in the material, and moves the electrons. The, the electrons actually kind of like to oscillate, and they don't suck up much energy from the material. But they do slow the wave down because of that interaction. And the, the details of this interaction are far beyond where I want to go in this series of lectures or for the course I'm teaching. But we would expect, because electrons are charges and they're allowed to move a little bit in the material, that there's going to be some kind of interaction between the propagating plane wave, the electric field, and the material itself. And we can explain this mathematically pretty straightforwardly. Now you remember that we got to the plane wave by deriving the wave equation. We started with Maxwell's equations and essentially what we did was we, we had this equation right here. We used some basically um, identities in vector calculus to get here and then what we did was we said okay we can we take this del cross h and substitute um, the current density remember j is equal to sigma e and the displacement current into that because remember magnetic fields are created by current distributions um, and from this point if we do the substitution we get an equation like this and we didn't like this very much because this term was going to make things difficult for us and so we made the assumption that the material is not conductive um, so if we do that that term goes away right there um, and by making the assumption of, of a sinusoidal wave we ended up with this equation right here where our sigmas dropped out and we just pulled the epsilon out of the D and put it right here in this equation. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, let's, let's throw away that assumption and throw away that solution and say, let's include now, to be more complete, that materials do have conductivity, that there are free charges, that they can conduct electricity. Um, in this case, it's fairly simple what we do. We just keep this whole term and we end up with a, a sigma and a complex term inside the equation that essentially we're going to use to get for our plane wave. Now how do we deal with this? This looks like a, a much more complicated solution, but in fact it's not. Essentially what we do is we just take this term and we say, gee, let's just treat the permittivity epsilon as a complex number. So I'm going to put an epsilon sub c down there. And, and there's nothing really tricky about this. There's nothing really difficult. It just says instead of being a regular real number, epsilon becomes a complex number. Um, not a problem at all. We can still get a solution. And essentially the, the complex permittivity is given by the epsilon we've used before, the real part of the permittivity plus a, uh, compl an imaginary term, j sigma over omega, and we usually represent this in this form right here, where we use epsilon prime as the real part of the permittivity, and epsilon double prime as the complex part of the permittivity, but you can see that epsilon prime really is just sigma over omega for a conductive material. In fact, you have materials that have an epsilon prime that aren't conductive at all, but that's beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about here. 
So going back to our picture of the physical picture of the permittivity, but saying now it's complex, essentially what I've done is we've got the same picture as before, but we've got um, two green electrons, which are the free electrons, which are allowed to move inside the material. And in a metal, there are going to be a lot more. In something like a semiconductor, maybe this is a reasonable picture. Um, but let's take a look at how the oscillating electric field from that plane wave coming in uh, looks in this case. Here we've got the oscillation of the electric field. Um, it's going to essentially drive those electron clouds. But similarly, because the electrons are free to move, the electric field is going to push on the electrons. And the, the free electrons aren't bound to one atom. Um, so they can move a lot farther. And remember, with our picture of conductivity, we saw that electrons bounced against lattice vibrations and sort of rattled around inside a material, which is why we had a non-infinite conductivity. And so essentially what's happening is that electrons as the electric field oscillates up and down, pushing these atoms, um, it sucks energy out of the electric field. Those free charges, those free electrons of the material, essentially require energy to be accelerated up and accelerated down, and up and down, and then re-accelerated after every little collision they have. Um, so what's going to happen is some of the energy of the electric field is going to be taken away. And so this is what happens when you have a non-zero conductivity. And so let's, ex let's see how we sor can sort of roll that into our plane wave description. So how does this complexivity modify the equation we've come up with for the plane wave, our mathematical understanding of a plane wave? So remember, here's our complex permittivity. It has a real part, epsilon prime, and an imaginary part, epsilon double prime. Um, we essentially just modify our expression for k, including a complex term, and we can write k as essentially a real part that we're going to call alpha and an imaginary part we're going to call beta. Um, and so our overall expression for k has this form right here. This changes our plane wave expression for our, our simplified plane wave going in the z direction from this to this term right here. And you'll notice there really aren't that many changes at all. For our, our, our solution we came up with before, where, where epsilon is a real number, we don't have a complex permittivity, we simply have a vector multiplied by a phase term. Uh, once we go ahead and, and make this assumption of complex permittivity, we essentially have our same vector that gives the amplitude to the field. Um, we have exactly the same phase term, but instead of k, we use beta, so that's just a switch of variables, nothing complex there at all. But we have this new term, e to the minus alpha z. And this shouldn't surprise us, because essentially this is an exponential decay. What it says is, as the wave propagates through a material, it loses energy to moving those electrons, and it has this exponential decay. It turns out that the terms alpha and beta, um, you have to go through some, some what's a good way to put this, um, algebraic calisthenics to get to. And there are a lot of derivations you can find on the web or in your textbook if you're interested in the math. But it turns out the relationship between the complex permittivity and alpha is given by this expression here. You notice it has terms for the real and imaginary parts of the permittivity, and you have a very, very similar expression for beta. Um, and we'll look next at some simplifications for this. To be complete, remember that a propagating plane wave doesn't just have an electric field component, although that's the part we, we generally consider. It has a magnetic component that in a general case given, is given by the cross product of the direction the wave's propagating, k hat, crossed with the electric field over the permittivity of free space. And the permittivity of free space now changes. And it essentially, it has this form right here. So we can calculate the magnetic field. It's a little bit more complicated. But guess what? We have calculators and computers today. They deal with imaginary numbers just fine. It so that's been a fair amount of equation, a fair amount of mathematics. Um, let's go ahead and try to simplify this a little bit. So essentially what we've done is we've taken our previous expression for the plane wave and we've simply replaced it with this expression right here where we've added a term that the amplitude decays exponentially as we go through the material. Um, so if we take a look at a graph of that, for a material that has low absorption, that the value of alpha is pretty small, you can see that this, this drop in the amplitudes is, is, is exponential, as you would expect here. But it's, it's pretty small. 
And this case of low absorption is when sigma is less than about 0.01 inverse ohms per meter. And in this case, um, you can basically simplify alpha. You don't need to use the whole long expression. And you can say alpha is approximately equal to something like that. this term, sigma over 2 over the square root of mu over epsilon prime. And beta is just the value of k we used before. Um, and so for materials that have low conductivity, this is a pretty good approximation. However, as the conductivity increases, you start to get into cases where things fall off a little bit more rapidly um, as the wave propagates into the material. And in this case, you have to use the full-blown expressions for alpha and beta. You can't make any approximations. Um, in the case that you have very high absorption and large values of sigma, you see that what's going to happen is that there's going to be a rapid exponential decay. You get rapid changes of the electric field with rather short changes of distance. In this case, you can also simplify it. And this, this happens when the conductivity is greater than about 100 inverse ohms per meter or Siemens per meter. And you can also simplify alpha and beta in this case right here. And they have the same form. And the electric field drops off quite rapidly. You go just a couple of wavelengths or even less into the material, and there's no field left whatsoever. The electric field has dropped off to zero, which is what we'd expect, because we don't have electric field inside conduct. I think it's going to help a lot to understand this if we take a look at several cases of plane waves with different values of alpha, the absorption coefficient, which gives the loss of the wave, and also beta, the phase constant, which tells how the waves, wave propagates. So essentially what I've done here is here's our equation for a plane wave. And I'm not using my pencil because I'm on a computer where, where I need to be able to play videos. And so essentially, we have an electric field. It's a vector, but we're ignoring this for the, the time. And we're just setting its value to 1. We can tell that because the wave here goes from 1 to negative 1. Um, here's the absorption, or the loss term, that's exponential. And we'll see how that works. And here's the phase term. And I'm going to basically play a movie of the wave varying as a function of time, and also how it spatially varies with different values of beta. Um, out here, I'm always going to assume beta is equal to 1, and alpha is equal to 0. Um, let's consider this free space. And this gray area is the material. And I'm going to give different values of beta and different values of alpha here. And I want to stress something, that the picture I'm doing is highly simplified. This is a non-physical case. We know, because of this equation down here for alpha and this equation down here for beta, that alpha and beta are strongly related. They depend on the real and imaginary parts of the complex permittivity. But in order to sort of illustrate things, I'm selecting values for beta and alpha that are very simple. And this would not correspond to a case you'd necessarily find. But it's going to illustrate sort of how waves propagate through different materials. So let's start the video and see what happens when I pretend the interface isn't here. Essentially, I've got beta equal to 1 on both sides of this interface, alpha equal to 0. And we would get exactly the behavior we expect. Now we just see a wave that's essentially changing in time and space. It has a velocity. It's moving along. And it's the same on both sides of this interface. I should also mention that I'm going to ignore reflections that would naturally occur at this interface. Um, we'll study those next. The next case I'm going to look at is where we have no loss, alpha is equal to 0, but we increase the value of beta. And let's see what the movie looks like in this case. Um, you see it propagates, but it slows down inside the material, and the wave sort of compresses. Spatially, the wavelengths get closer together. This makes perfect sense, because my phase is changing more rapidly for each value of z. Because beta is bigger, it basically is going to cause the wave to go through one oscillation faster in a smaller z. Because remember, every time beta z changes by 2 pi, we get one oscillation of the wave. So let's see that again. In higher beta materials, the wave compresses spatially, and it also slows down. It goes slower. And we can see this even more if we go to the next case and look at the case of beta equals to 3. So let's run our little movie here again. You can see that things are even more compressed. And they're compressed because that wave has slowed down. The phase velocity is dropped by a factor of 3 as I go into this material. Now let's move into a material that has loss. Now we're instead of setting alpha equal to 0, um, where, of course, if alpha is 0, this term here becomes 1. We're going to set alpha equal to 1, but we're going to keep beta equal to 1 just to keep things simple. And essentially, what you're going to see is the wave coming in and have this exponential decay you can already see on the screen. So let's run the movie there. There goes the wave. It's coming in. And it decays exponentially as it goes away from the surface. Um, pretty straightforward. 
if I were to go to the next case and increase alpha even more, set alpha equal to 3 but keep beta equal to 1, you'll see the decay is quite a bit stronger, but the wave is essentially propagating the same velocity on both sides because beta is the same on both sides of this interface. So notice things decay a lot faster when we increase alpha. And let's go to the next one, and here we have alpha equal to 10, which is the case of essentially a very lossy dielectric. And you can see that wave decays very rapidly away from the surface. We get just a little way in, and there's no field left because all the energy has gone in to moving those charges up and down. And this is a very lossy material. Hopefully this is giving you a sense of how alpha and beta have different effects on the wave. Um, let's look at our last case where I set sort of a middle case, alpha equal to 3 and beta equal to 3, and look at what the movie looks like in this case. Again, you get the decay away from the surface. Because of the high beta, the material slows down. The wavelength squishes down and becomes a lot smaller. And one more time, this is what a material would look like that has both a different value of beta than free space and some loss to it. The wave decays exponentially and there's a difference in the way the phase propagates through space. Again, let me stress that this is a highly simplified non-physical case because I'm just choosing values of alpha and beta out of the air to illustrate the case, but exactly the same types of behavior happens if there are relationships between alpha and beta. Now there's one other effect we need to be aware of as we sort of work through this, and that's that in highly conductive materials, since the electric field decays very, very rapidly, um, conductors don't behave the same way as you might think they would at DC frequencies. And we call this skin depth. And skin depth is essentially just how far the field goes into a material. And since it decays basically as um, e to the minus 1 or 1 over e um, in a distance alpha, the skin depth basically is just equal to 1 over alpha. So let's see how that works. Um, let's go back to our case of a, a wire or a cylindrical resistor. We remember when we were working with fields, the resistance of this is just basically the length of the wire that I'm calling D over sigma, which is the conductivity of the material, times A, which is the area of the wire right here. Um, but electricity won't be conducted over this whole wire because the electric field decays very, very rapidly as it goes through the material. So in essence, what you're going to get is you're going to get all of the current flowing in essentially a donut-shaped region around the outside of the wire. And the thickness of this donut is the skin depth, approximately, or about 1 over alpha. Um, since in a highly conductive material, alpha is equal to this term right here, omega mu sigma over 2, we can rewrite with a little bit of algebra our resistance as having this term right here. So we've gone from a more simple uh, value or expression for resistance to a more complicated one when we have to start to think about AC voltages rather than DC voltages. To give you an idea of the sense of this, if we have a copper wire about one meter long and two meters and uh, two millimeters in diameter, if I did the calculations correctly on my calculator for DC frequencies or a frequency of zero hertz, we'd find the resistance is about five milliohms per meter. Um, however, if we start to work at frequencies that are much higher, on the order of a gigahertz. Um, the absorption coefficient is fairly high using this expression right here, and it turns out that the resistance goes up by nearly a factor of 200 to about 1.3 ohms per meter. And this is going to get worse and worse as the frequency gets higher because it's going to scale as the square root of the frequency. Take home message on this is that since electric fields don't penetrate into conductors when they're oscillating at high frequencies, the current's carried over the surface, the resistance goes up. If you're having to carry a lot of power at high frequencies, you need to be aware of this because it can cause surface heating of things because, again, wires don't behave the same way as we saw before when you get to higher and higher frequencies.